What up? Welcome to Vicariously Podcast. Thank you for joining us, whether this is your first time or your fourth time. I don't know. Uh, Today's guests, very cool. They're a little shy. I will give them that. They have never been on the radio. They've never been on TV uh, because they are pretty new to this entrepreneurial move slash venture that they've gotten into. But really cool guys and very, very unique entrepreneurial venture. So today's guests are Mark and Dylan, who are the two owners of Blackbird Tiny Homes. Now, what makes them unique? They are unique because not only are they building small tiny homes ranging from 240 square feet all the way up to about 480 square feet, I believe is the one that they had on site when I was there. Um, The second thing that makes them pretty unique is that they are located in Calgary, Canada. Now, it's pretty cold up there, and so the difference in the homes that you're going to find in Calgary versus the U.S., there is a major, major difference when it comes to insulation. Now, when you're operating with a tiny home, you don't have a lot of space to begin with. So to take away several inches all the way around your build just for insulation makes you have to be a little bit more creative. So um, they speak about how they've gotten into this venture. They speak about kind of the pros and cons of getting into it, but really, really interesting guys. Uh, Mark has been in the whole home building renovation world for at least 25 years, I believe he says, and and Mark's more on the uh, engineering side and mechanical side, whereas Dylan has the carpentry um, and kind of the details oriented, I guess, when it comes to uh, building everything out, whereas uh, Mark is more inclined to be doing the bones, the structure, the wiring, etc. But either way, really, really cool setting. You're going to see some of the pictures uh, in the in this video of kind of the setting, um, also one of the homes that they're being built. But for anyone who's just listening to this and not watching it, it was negative five, negative three, somewhere in there. It was freezing outside, but we were sitting inside this tiny home, the three of us, and conducting the podcast. So really cool guys, check them out um, online, blackbirdtinyhomes.com. But I hope you enjoy, again, bear with them. They were a little shy right out of the gates, but really cool product and really excited to see how they do. Mark and Dylan, Blackbird Tiny Homes, out. All right, we are here with Mark and Dylan, as promised. Uh, You wanna wanna say a little hello? Hello, this is Mark. Hey, this is Dylan. How's it going? Great, guys. So um, we're going to jump right into it. We've already given you kind of the background as far as your company and, and how you guys started. And uh, one of the things I wanted to kind of give the the listeners is, is a broad overview of how you got into it, because I know you're only a couple years into this venture. Um, it sounds like I know your background just from what I've read and... Um, it is it is not in tiny home building and it hasn't even been in home building for that matter. I know Dylan's has been more of from a, from a um, carpentry standpoint, from a just everything aspect to, to deal with home building. And, um, but your background is more from an engineering. Is that, is that fair to say? Uh, it's not so much engineering, but more mechanical, mechanical type of assembly and, and building. Um, so I've, I've worked on aircraft engines. I've worked on uh, building robotic machines for hospitals, um, hydrogen and natural gas dispensers, just a wide range of different things, different manufacturing, but mostly mechanical, yeah. So how did you get into that? To manufacturing? Yeah. I just needed a job one yeah. year, and I ended up going to manufacturing because it was pretty much the easiest one to get, and then it just kind of snowballed from there. It just got a better position and a better position. And, but the thing about manufacturing was... Uh, a lot of it gets uh, shipped offshore. You know, they can't compete with China and Mexico and those places. So, unfortunately, I had to go sometimes from job to job yeah. just because of that. And so, all of that background work was was here in Canada. Yeah, here in Canada. Um, not all here in Calgary. I was in Winnipeg for about thirteen years, and some of it was in Ontario. And Dylan, you're you want to get dive into your background a little bit? Uh, sure. Um, so I started in construction in 1990. Um, from there, it pretty much started renovations, doing small work on my own. Uh, eventually got to a point where we were doing a lot of commercial work. So building out restaurants and stores under pretty strict guidelines and timelines. So, uh, as that became, uh, less and less, uh, you move into other items, uh, such as building homes. 
Um, I started building homes probably uh, 12 years ago in Ontario. Uh, did about five or six out there. Uh, and then came out to Alberta in 2006. Um, didn't come out for any other purpose than just to uh, start a new life. <laughs> Nice. Just kind of do something different. Drove out here on my own. Um, but yeah, beyond that, uh, built a couple infills here. So I've done through my construction company. Um, we built uh, probably about seven, I think we're at now. And we have another couple coming up uh, in the near future. It's always good uh, to keep in the, you know, that type industry yeah. until the tiny homes have really picked up and become more stable and more, you know, steady. So this this development that we are in right now, what is your what is your connection with that? Is it with, just just where you live, uh, like Heritage with, Hills? With Heritage Hills, yeah, um, nothing much. Like I mean, we just moved out here about a year and a half ago, and uh, yeah, we we just I just love the area. Love the it's outside of the city, so it's nice and quiet. You know, the property I have is pretty big, so I'm able to build an exterior garage and have a space to build tiny homes or do whatever I want. So so here's kind of the the part that I know nothing about and I've tried to read off the website, but how did you two meet? Because I know it's a, a relatively new business venture, but how did you two as friends and, and now business partners meet? All right. Well, I will pass it back over to Mark because Mark actually was the one that uh, contacted me. Yeah, actually, uh, I was building tiny homes with a, under a different name before and um I was actually looking for a different different partner and then ended up going online, found an ad. There was someone in Cochrane building tiny homes and I was like, oh, okay, well, let's let's call him up and let's meet and see what happens. And uh, I actually called him up. We met that day in Calgary and uh, we kind of hit it off. We were like, you know, the same age. We got along really well and we're like, well, why don't we just put our heads together and just join forces and start building tiny homes together? And that's pretty much where it was. Nice. So the, the previous venture... You, I read a little bit. You had you had done something for the city. You had built a, would it be called self-contained tiny home for the city? For uh, it wasn't for the city. It was for Parks Canada. Okay. So it was at the Waterton Park. Yep. So it was a government thing. They were just running a uh, a program. They wanted to put a couple tiny houses in a in a park where people you know bring their motor homes and travel trailers just to see what kind of um, attention it would get. Mm-hmm. And they knew it was it was trending, becoming a thing, and they thought, well, if we can get some tiny homes there, maybe we can rent them out, and that's just an extra revenue stream for them. Uh, so we built one for them, and there was we were one of two builders that had a tiny house at that park, and it was just for the summer. And uh, they said if it went well, they were going to put uh, tiny homes in, in parks all across Canada for the next four years. So I, I think it went well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, why would you why would you walk away from that situation? Uh, it just wasn't really, as far as the partnership goes, it just really, really working out. Yeah. And, uh, I just, I'm just, I've had a number of jobs and work with a number of people over the years. And, and if things aren't working out, it's just better to, to walk away. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good answer. And it's, that's why I press you a little bit because we've, we've heard that a number of times through, through other entrepreneurs. And sometimes it starts off as really good friends and it doesn't turn out the best. And sometimes it starts off as family and it doesn't and it goes south and then typically some of the some of the best partnerships that I've I've come across have been the ones that you didn't really have a background and you, you of together but you had what your expertise was and what their expertise was and then common goal kind of comes together yeah it was pretty much the same thing you know I, I think the way it was going it wasn't going to get any better so rather than just prolong it you know find fun in the yeah partner. So you you have the engineering background and you started in tiny homes and then Dylan has the kind of finishing touches and and the the full home idea and the extensive background of start to finish on homes. So you guys come together, you come up with this this plan to start building them. What are some of the first kind of business decisions that that came about to start the company? Uh, I think the, one of the first things we had to do was just come up with some floor plans. You know, uh, tiny houses are it's such a wide range of of things that you can do. They're all pretty much custom because everybody's different, you know, whether you're by yourself or whether you're you know, a family of four or five, uh, you know, we were more or less doing custom homes before that, but we really wanted to um, just get some floor plans and, and start doing the same type of building over and over again, rather than starting from scratch. Yeah. I mean, uh, basically if, if we're trying to keep the cost down for these tiny homes, I mean, you can very quickly escalate to a much higher price point and, by keeping them fairly generic uh, with the same type models, uh, like on our website, um, the idea being that okay, we can in, you know increase the size or decrease the size of the trailer, which would give you more or less square footage. Uh, change the lofts, change it a bit inside so that you have the basics um, 
suited to yourself. But beyond that would be, you know, you could still customize interior finishings, you know, types of cabinetry, the types of appliances, all mm -hmm. that stuff is still custom because you know what? It's very personal. Uh, build a house. You want personal stuff inside because it's going to be your forever home or at least a home that you're going to mm -hmm. live in for the next couple of years anyways. So one of the, one of the things that I've, I've just looked into and read about is obviously the, they're, I don't want to call it a fad because it's not a fad. It, it is, it is a, um, it is a very driven movement, uh, for lack of better term, but it's it's this movement that people want better options. Um, but but some of the things that I've read is like container homes. You're still dealing with permits. You're still dealing with um, all the moving parts that that essentially a, a home would be. So is that one of the beauties of tiny homes? Is that essentially you're bypassing a lot of the the permitting of that goes into building any other normal house, establishing a foundation and electrical, et cetera. Yeah. So basically with, with a tiny home on wheels, it's classified as an RV, so a recreation vehicle. Um, with it being an RV, then you can go to any park, um, any, you know, campground and be able to hook up or do your own um, in your technical backyard if you have enough square footage or if you have a, you know, main residence that's already there. That's the biggest fight right now with bylaw and with um, different townships is that if you don't have a residency, you can't have this as your main resident. Now, if you put it on foundation, you do, well, then you're talking mobile home. Well, that's a totally different animal, right? Mm -hmm. So, and those things start at like $120,000 and up. Yeah. So we're trying to keep the cost down, still be custom, still be able to fit like six people in here comfortably. You know, we're not even touching, you know, anywhere near how many people could probably squeeze mm -hmm. into a 24 foot tiny home. So, but yeah, no, it, it's just the overall idea being that if you keep it mobile, people can, you know, pick it up, go change. Like a lot of people want to just go head into BC or mm -hmm. down to Washington or wherever and just kind of cruise around so as it sits right now you guys have been in business for a year and a half roughly uh, we're about uh, just under a year okay we're just under a year yeah how many homes total to date have you have you done uh together this is our first okay um so i've done two prior to this uh, i believe mark's done one prior to this the water demo um and then i've also done uh like a mobile salon hair nice. thing in an rv in a big bus mm -hmm. right so i converted that into something that's kind of cool and you know, made it all custom for them as well. So, so the the folks that you've you've currently worked with, obviously the the parks that you already mentioned, are they um, are they treating this more? I know that you have obviously all of the the capabilities to make it com fully customized. Are they treating this as um, going off the grid? I don't even need the hookups predominantly, or has it been um, more tor tailored towards? Still wanting the hookups, going to go to an RV park, set up, and stay there for a long time. Well, in the experience that we've had in this, you know, last couple of years, the people that we've talked to even, um, there's only been really like a handful of people that want to stay completely off-grid. Everyone still wants to tap in to have fresh water, to have electricity. You know, the cost of solar is still pretty high. Mm -hmm. So to get a solar system that would run a tiny home completely would be close to 10 grand Canadian. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, it's a big touch when you're talking, you know, just because I don't want to pay a $34 a month bill to somebody, right? So, you know, it's hard to get that. So they're mostly all wanting to still be, you know, in their parents' backyard, but not in their basement kind of thing. So <laughs> good analogy. So they, outside of power though, they still could potentially have the ability because it'll have the, the RV hookup. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. But then it could always be tailored to, to go off the grid just with, with additional upgrades. Yeah, with additional upgrades, you could get a smaller solar system that could run just strictly lights, uh, potentially a fridge. Um, but, you know, then again, you're still going to be looking to plug other items in. So you might have to get an inverter from a bunch of batteries or whatever to try to pick that up, you know, from a different source. But it, it's it's still expensive right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So here's my here's here's my. Uh my thought, so behind everything is, I, I love these things. I, I think it's fascinating, and I think that I have no idea when, but uh, I envision myself uh, headed that route. And I, I'm, my brother is, has done extensive research on converting a Sprinter van, and uh, my cousin has lived in his van for a couple of years. This was a while ago when he worked for the Parks and Rec of um, Idaho. And so it's, it's kind of been in our family that we've always been interested in this stuff. One of the stats that I that I came across was that um, uh, two out of every five tiny home buyers are or owners are over the age of 50. And 
I, I think that kind of surprised me because you assume that by that age, you've done your due diligence, you've invested, you have your retirement and you've paid off your fancy big house. Um, but instead they're looking to travel. So is that unique to the U S or Canada or any of the people that you've seen? What, what are your thoughts behind that? Uh, Right now, I think we're pretty much, I mean, I could see that being a smaller percentage here. Um, yeah. All of our clients so far have been under the age of 30. Mm -hmm. So uh, the tiny home we're sitting in right now, I think she's 27, 26, 27. He's like 28 maybe. And the other one that we're building, um, she's 25 and he just turned 23. <laughs> so, you know, and they just want to get out of the rental game and they just want to get into their own thing. And uh yeah, just, I mean, you buy a home in, in Alberta, it's half a million dollars. Yeah. You know, it's it's a big stretch and a big commitment, so. Yeah, I had a, I had another another fun fact here, and it is um, a couple of them. 89% of tiny home owners have less credit card debt than uh, general U.S. Um, citizens, and then 65% of tiny home owners slash buyers have zero credit card debt, which I think is pretty phenomenal. Um, and then, so from a cost perspective, so this, how many square, square feet is the unit that we're sitting in now? Yeah. I, I think this, this 24 footer is around 290 square feet and it's got two lofts, two, two upstairs lofts. Yeah. And this so, is an actual loft, a fairly sized loft, the main bedroom loft here. Mm -hmm. And then this is just another loft where she just wanted a, her own space away from anything else where she could do her yoga or, or read a book or whatever. So that's cool. Yeah. 290? So it's 290. 290. 290, and it's built on a 24 foot. 24 foot. And we can go up to 40 feet, 40 foot trailer. So that's, you can get pretty big. I mean, you, you can go almost up to like 400 square feet, I would think, or pretty close to. That's 28, uh, units, that's 340 square feet. So the 28 foot is 340 square feet. Yeah. So, so yeah, the 28 could, foot, is that the one that's behind? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this couple that, that is buying this one, you said the he's taller. Is that? Yeah, I think he's he's at least six foot four anyway, maybe six five. So six foot four, two hundred and ninety square feet. <laughs> you got a two bedroom house essentially, and they couple in close quarters. Are they married? I don't think they're married. It could be no. trouble. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how long it lasts. Yeah. Uh, no. Well, you know what? They love this tiny house. I mean, mm -hmm. they just think it's the greatest thing, and. Uh, yeah, they actually come by almost every week just to nice. see the progress of it, and they're just like, "Wow, you guys are awesome!" You know, it's gorgeous. So, from a from a production standpoint, what's what is your rough timeline? So, when you started versus where we sit now versus when you kind of expect this to be wrapped up? Yeah, like our trailers, we get custom made here in Alberta, so that'll take two or three weeks just to do that, and then once we get the trailer here, uh, depending on the size and the complexity two to three months typically. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm guessing that one of the major factors is insulation because we're so far north. Yeah. I, I think, you know, some people that are looking at tiny houses, you've got to be careful if they go down to the States and, and buy something down there because it's probably not insulated for the minus, what was it minus, last week? Minus 30. <laughs> so <laughs> that's Celsius, but it's still, yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we, you know, we basically build these and insulate them just like we would a regular house. Mm -hmm. So, and plus it's such a small space. It doesn't take that much to heat it up really. So from a buyer's perspective, if it would be great if someone is listening that wants to buy one, but in general, from a buyer's perspective, what can they walk us through kind of the process that, that would take part from the time that they are interested to the time that you hand over the keys and it's off the lot? Uh, well, I mean, our, our basics always just initial meeting, uh, see if they're actually, you know, looking and understand the size of home that they're converting to. A lot of people don't realize that 290 square feet, mind you, on two little floors uh, is pretty tight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a oversized glorified, you know, camper, right? You're living in a camper. So <laughs> it, you know, the number one comment that people have... Sorry, the number one comment that people have when they come here is that I can't believe how big it is. Mm -hmm. Even though it's tiny, even though you, you know, when you take your stuff in here, you're like, where am I going to put all this stuff? Yeah, that's the first thing that everyone says. Wow, it's so big. I didn't realize it was this big. Well, we, I mean, you're a, you're a bigger guy. We're, we're three guys chilling here in the living room. I mean, obviously the stove isn't in here and cabinetry, but still it, it is very roomy. And I'm surprised from a height standpoint, obviously you custom built it for them, but from a height perspective, yeah, it's, I've been in plenty of, uh, in motorhomes and campers that, that, um, you know, have a, a cocked head. So this is, there's, there's definitely plenty of room in here. Yeah. 
I think psychologically too, you just got to get used to the really low ceiling. And yeah. then once you get beyond that point where you feel, I'm not going to hit my head every single time I walk into the bathroom, <laughs> then you're okay. Mm-hmm. So when I was saying it's, it's about getting people to understand that when you're moving into a smaller home, um, until they've actually been in one. Most of these people have never been in one. So once they actually step into our, you know, demo unit or show home, then they're like, holy cow, that's a 10 foot ceiling. <laughs> you know, when your apartment's only eight feet mm-hmm. and then you walk in and you get 10 foot ceilings, it feels a lot roomier. So, I mean, people in general are, are pretty happy with the, you know, initial stages, uh, getting into contract and, you know, deposits, design, all these things, um, you know, comes in standard when you're doing any kind of renovation, any kind of build, any kind of house, including tiny house. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a matter of uh, just making sure all expectations are up on the table. Everyone knows what they're going to get, what they expect from us and what we're expecting from them. So if they have design things that they got to kick in, like today they gave us their flooring you know we're at that stage right now but if we had to wait for another week well then that's going to be putting everyone behind right so i mean uh yeah start to finish i think you know if we can get within that two to three month mark um and they have that understanding it's going to take that time because we don't cut corners Mm -hmm. i mean we're talking r20 walls r40 roof you know there's a lot of insulation in here we haven't turned the heater on in about an hour yeah so and it's not too bad no it's not no so I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a t-shirt. baby, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a t-shirt, so. <laughs> yeah. say, what is it, zero outside? One, two? Yeah. Somewhere in there? Yeah. Fahrenheit? Yeah. No, we're doing good. All right, so I, I, that's a huge that's a huge attribute. I, I think that the irony is that we're sitting in a, a 290-square-foot home for a couple that's in their mid-20s that can afford a, a home, and we're sitting in a... Um, giant development that is all the houses are pretty similar um, i'm guessing there's only a handful of floor plans for these these townhouses how many townhouses are around a couple hundred at least okay. around 600 yeah. so 600 and we're sitting in a very unique opportunity sitting in the backyard at a third of the pre- fifth sixth of the price <laughs> Ten. Yeah. I, you know, I had a house too, you know, just like everyone else, I wanted a house. I rented for a long, long time. Finally got a house and it was just over a thousand square feet on the main floor. It was a fully finished basement. And I used like 15% of the house mm-hmm. in five years. I just never did anything with all the other rooms. And the basement was just more or less storage and laundry. That was it, you know. And we moved out here, we sold the house and we just sold a lot of crap that just <laughs> accumulated over the years. And it's like, wow, really? I never used that. You know, mm-hmm. you sell it, you, you buy it for a thousand dollars, you end up selling it for like 50 bucks yep. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll never go back to that. It's funny you say that because I've, I've got another stat for you here and I read that the um, the average tiny home size is approximately 180 square, 186 square feet, whereas the... approximate or average size for a U.S. home is 2,100 square feet. So I'm guessing that that is taking into account their yard and property and or townhome, condo, et cetera. But overall, that is that is a massive, massive difference. And then obviously the, the price that follows with that. So pricing-wise, roughly how much are you, are you um, charging for, for the tiny homes? So they more or less start around 45,000. Uh, is and that then Canadian? Up, yeah, Canadian, <laughs> which is what probably about twenty thousand US <laughs> right now. Uh, and then it goes up to around a hundred thousand, depending mm-hmm. on what you want. I mean, anywhere from sixteen feet long to forty feet long, and then all different kinds of options. Like the off-grid options are pretty pricey, as Dylan was saying, like with the solar panels and everything. Mm-hmm. So there's quite a wide range there. And have you, from your experience so far, have most people come in with? A, a kind of a preconceived notion on here's what I want it to be, or I looked around on the internet and I saw this cool feature and I want you to incorporate that, or has it been more, look, you guys are the pros, you show me what, what you think is best? I found they've been pretty informed, actually. Um, in fact, this one, they found uh, a model online. It, we're not we're not building exactly like the model they found online, yeah. but it's it's fairly similar. They just wanted, we like this layout. Can you guys do something like this? Hmm. And uh, there's been a few other ones, the same thing. We, we found this one online. Seems like a lot of people have been watching a lot of the shows on yeah. TV and on, on YouTube. There's the odd one that doesn't really know much about them, but, you know, wants to get into them. But uh, they're pretty well informed for mm-hmm. the most part. So to, back, to take a, 
a step backwards from a from a business standpoint. I think not to not to encourage competition out there, but um, you know, from a from an entrepreneurial standpoint, it doesn't seem like a ton of overhead to get this to get this production going. I, I think that obviously it comes down to a ton of knowledge on how you can make such a such a uh, a home into these tight quarters as far as I mean I, I see the is that the sewer line right there is would that be the plumbing so yeah I mean having the plumbing having the electrical obviously there's a lot of moving parts in such a tight area but um, from a business development standpoint from the time that you guys decided to really start this what were some of the the challenges and overhead that the biggest challenge I think is really cost of material I mm-hmm. mean our materials in this thing are pretty pretty expensive i mean we're not able to get like a lot of reusable stuff that uh you know when you're selling something new and everything has to be new mm-hmm. so when you go out and buy you know pine or cedar or whatever it is that you're using the costs are still up there mm-hmm. you know like for us to at the end of the day we're just making a small wage like this is not a don't go into this business <laughs> thinking you're <laughs> making money you're not getting rich no no, you're doing this because you enjoy the movement. You, mm-hmm. I like the idea. You know, ultimately, I would love to, but I have two small kids, so it's kind of hard. You know, my wife is, uh, she's just not really into the tiny home thing right now. Uh, she's been in it. Yeah, I just wanted to be political. <laughs> you know, she's she's been into it. She wants to see this one complete because mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that are, I can't really envision it till it's yeah. done. And, uh, you know, once you're in here and it's done, it's comfortable and... You know, people would probably move towards, yeah, you know what, I can do this. Or I can do it for six months a year. Mm-hmm. You know, once it starts getting really cold and people have to park their cars outside, not in their warm garage, it's, you know, they start losing a lot of the, I want to go to the bathroom and not have, you know, someone else hear me within yeah. the same 20 feet, right? So, yeah, there's a there's quite a bit of change. But I think most of these people that do the research understand that, you know. So it brings me to a, a good question i don't even know if you guys have the answer i don't think anyone has the answer but how do we how do we mass produce this so there's so many people out there that that are that are into tiny homes and there's so many people that are interested but i think one of the major hang-ups is where the hell am i going to park this thing and so and it, and it comes it comes into you know how how can i power it how where can i park it, it i do want to travel all over but when i get there wh- what do i do yeah, that's that's the biggest challenge, even like all through the states, through here. Um, like there's a, a gentleman in the news, he just recently got removed by the township asking him to move his tiny home. Um, you know, quite honestly, you know, we've been asked to uh, relocate one of the two tiny homes. We're only allowed to have one on a property. So, um, and the town of Cochrane has been gracious enough to give us a little bit of extra time. But um yeah, up until that point, you know, there's no mm-hmm. more mass producing unless you're in a big warehouse with, you know, heavy overhead again, and then costs go up. You know, we're start, you know, three thousand dollars a month plus utilities or whatever. I mean, it can start costing, rolling down, right? Everything rolls back down to the consumer. So yeah, it's definitely, definitely an interesting, you know, <laughs> direction. I'm not sure where we're going, but yeah, like you were saying, hard to answer. I don't think you can mass produce them at all right now, mm-hmm. you know, until the government really steps up and, and takes these as a permanent living house rather than a mobile home because, you know, they're classified here as, as an RV, mm-hmm. a recreational vehicle. But it's not a recreational vehicle because you're not taking this to the, the lake on the weekend. You're living in it full time. But they haven't updated the laws yet to allow people to live in it full time. So until they do that, it's going to be pretty difficult to really mass produce it or to get people to, to get into this kind of lifestyle. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. No, I, I can definitely see that. Some of the, one of the things that we we started talking before we hit record here was that they're starting these kind of camps. So essentially, someone or some builder, some property owner will will carve out X number of acres and and um, have either their town, county, city approval, and then be able to offer up twenty spots or thirty spots or whatever it may be for for tiny homes. And I think um, it's kind of two parts to it where they where that homeowner or that landowner ends up making their their money is that they're still charging rent which which ends up being relatively steep because of the hookups um but that helps pay off the the land that they purchased and um number two they're they're few and far between and they're also 
off the beaten path. So you're not you're not going to get that waterfront property or or the lakefront property because it's just people would rather hang on to that that land and they're not coughing that up to to allow parking on it. Yeah, and the other thing too is I mean most people live in the city, right? So if they're parking on acreage somewhere, it's a long drive if they're working in the city. And for some people, that's not really an option. Mm-hmm. And in here, if you want to open up that type of tiny house village, which I've seen in the States, it's great. But here again, they, they classify it as an RV. So they want you to basically open an RV park. So you got to have a driveway to each home. You got to have electrical. You got to have plumbing. You got to have sewer. You got to have all these things in place. And to do that, I mean, you're going to need a lot of money. So we don't have that much money. So yeah. <laughs> we'd love to open one up, you know, and we get that much money. We probably will. But for now, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a huge challenge. So where do you guys, where do you sit as of today? You've already built some, some really cool places. Obviously, um, this one is, is close to being done. You have one in back that is already ordered and being worked on. What is your, I don't want to say five-year plan because I think that's stupid, but what's your, what is your goal? Where do you guys see yourself heading as far as company goes? Yeah, well, I, I, I think ultimately it has to go to finding land, it has to go to finding someone that's willing to invest uh, get the RV status on a piece of property and build out 40, 50, 60 spots. I bet you would fill, <laughs> even now with the, yeah. you know, in Canada, it'd probably fill 40 slots so quickly that you'd have to open more acreage, you know. But um, people that I've talked to have definitely allowed for, you know, more than willing to spend five, 600 bucks a month. Mm-hmm. No problem. Like they've already invested into this home. They now want to have a, you know, place that they can call their own not only can they just pick up and leave but they want to be able to you know also go home at night and not worry about having a yellow tag on the front of your car going hey you owe us 1500 bucks if you leave it here for another night right from the township or city or whatever so uh yeah i mean i'd love to see a movement where everyone hooks up to their truck and just drives it into the city and just parks it right out front of the (laughs) the government building and just be like here you go hey where are we gonna park that'd be a nice movement yeah let's just get it out there Literally emails where people said, you know, if you guys have a know a place where I can park one, like we'll order one tomorrow. Really? You know, yeah, it's happened quite a few times. Yeah. And you have to turn them away. I have to turn them away. Ugh. I mean, what can I do? I, I actively look for spots, you know, for people, but there's not there's not a lot of spots available. There's an odd one that pops up on the internet, but it's gone right, right oh, away. That's frustrating. Turning away business. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I uh, I can imagine. So so um. Obviously, I, I, I this is this is a general question, but um, what makes what makes your homes different than than other ones out there? The competitors say. I mean, to say that they're going to be different. Um, most of the Canadian homes I'm finding are being built with a thicker insulation wall, a thicker roof, a thicker floor. It's because they know if you're in construction, you know that you cannot survive with R14 insulation, which is just like a two by four wall. You're just going to freeze. Your furnace will be going all the time. Mm-hmm. Then you may as well just go out and buy a regular RV, you know, or and, a tent. which is a three <laughs> season. Yeah, which is just a three season situation, right? Where this, you know, minus 30, we had the heater going. It would turn on and off because we were cooking. Then we'd have to turn it back on just because it gets a little cool in here. But once we actually have a furnace going constantly with thermostat, you'd never notice it. You know, we're able to, you know, install, you know, a level of insulation that's equivalent to your regular home here in Alberta. Anyways, I know the stuff down south is way different, but, you know, up here in uh, anywhere north of probably the border. I mean, a lot of the northern Mm -hmm. states, Washington, you know, Montana, all those places would have cold enough situation where they need it as well right so but yeah it's just a matter of if you know not cutting any corners and just using top grade stuff like we don't like i hate cutting corners because it always comes back to bite me in the ass so yeah (laughs) so this this unit um from a from a customization standpoint how customized is this one versus um say the one in back versus ones that you've done in the past this is pretty This is right around the middle. I mean, if you look at this having two lofts, um, I'd probably say standard at a 20 or 24 foot would only have a single loft. Um, This having two lofts, and then we're changing some of the cabinetry inside. You know, 
the general basic bones would be the exterior, the insulation, yeah, you know, the roof, stuff like that stays the same among all because it's just a minimum requirement. Um, the larger 28 foot that's behind us is probably more custom than this. It has a couple cantilevers out the back end, so it makes the upper floor even bigger uh, and then allows for more space in the main floor mm-hmm. looking up. So I, s- I did see uh, some of the ones that you've done online, the, the, fold down deck that seems pretty unique for you guys i haven't seen that on on something before yeah, it's about you know transporting right we want to try to get something that's uh that's movable you know yeah. if we can get it to a point where you're not pulling around um you know parts and pieces to make a deck or you just leave your front door and you go right to the floor you know to the ground which is fine too but when you can actually have your own deck to put a barbecue on a table and chair and just kind of hang out and do that then Mm -hmm. you know it's a pretty neat option right and power wench hit a button and the deck goes up drop it down it's pretty simple so what's next for you guys you you're been around for a year you've got a, a couple already out there you have a couple on the way um just give us kind of your thoughts on what's What's next from a from a business standpoint as far as how many you want to produce or, or kind of what's your timeline on that? And then the second part is um, from a marketing standpoint, I think that it it is a, a niche and obviously that's a, a difficult um, group to market to. But when you produce top level stuff and you have the reviews and um, people do see you in the community, you can quickly get backed up with orders. So from a from a business standpoint, kind of what do you have next? And then from a from a marketing standpoint, I guess relatable, how how do the how do you get there with both of them? Yeah, I think it's a niche market, but uh, but it's a trending market. So I think it's always it's gonna get bigger and bigger. And I think I read not long ago that Canadians were the most indebted people in the, <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> I know. And uh, and just this movement the way it's going and uh, the way people just are sick and tired of the debt that they have and um, I think it's just going to keep growing. So it's a niche market now, but it, I don't really see it being that way in the future. It might take some time here. I don't know. But uh, from a marketing point, actually, I'm not really, I haven't really looked too far into the future, to be honest with you. I, I We have a pretty small crew. I mean, it's just Dylan and myself, and we have one other guy, Jeff, he works for us. Uh, he's been a carpenter for how many years? Yeah, about eight years. So it's just the three of us. So we're not exactly going to be pumping out a lot of these homes, mm-hmm. I think realistically we don't want to just do five or six a year right now until we can get a bigger place i mean we're just building them as you can see just in a pretty small area with a small shop so until we get uh you know we'd like to get bigger we'd like to get a a bigger shop and we'd like to get a show home a lot of people when they call us or email us do you have a home you know finished home and we're like well no we don't (laughs) you know we're just a custom builder so we kind of build them one at a time okay well give me a call when it's done i want to come down take a look at it so uh from a marketing point we want to have a, a home that we can just kind of showcase, you know, bring it around. There's a lot of a lot of shows too that call us like home and garden shows, and they'll say, "Well, do you have a tiny house?" I mean, we'll we'll put it in the show, and we won't even charge you. I mean, and some yeah. of these people are paying a lot of money to be there, um, but because they're trending and there's not a lot of them around there, they're like, "If you have one, I mean, we'll put it in the show." But we don't have one, <laughs> so. And you know what's going to happen if you do have one? Yeah, someone's going to buy it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, and, and it's gonna be really tough to say, <laughs> no, this is our show home. We just we just lug it around. Yeah. You can't have it. <laughs> but don't worry, we'll build you one in two months. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, and actually, we've had a number of calls where people. I'm not joking. People have actually said, "Do you have one built right now? I will come down like today, and buy it." And we're like, once again, I'm like, you know, Damn. I'm sorry to Damn. turn you away, but no, we we don't have any uh, pre-built. So. I mean, we're just sort of starting out, so we're not at that mm-hmm. stage yet. But, I mean, I think that's the goal for next year, you know, to get that tiny house built so we can kind of drive it around and, and bring it to shows and show people. And I think that's that pretty much sells itself, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'd, there's obviously no right or wrong answer, but from from just people that I've sat with, and, and I'm sure anyone listening, there's there's a lot of respect that goes on for your comments of not cutting corners, and there's a lot of respect that goes into of, you clearly want this to be a a lifestyle um, company and a lifestyle movement, and so uh, obviously you'd love to make a ton of money, but at the same time you're not going to sell yourself short and mass produce these. Number one and number two, um, it it is more about doing it right, getting it sitting with the clients, making sure that you're managing expectations and delivering exactly what it is they they're paying for. And especially in this case, I have no idea about the 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 couple that is getting ready to buy this, but early to mid twenties, I'm guessing that they don't have a ton of money. And this is, this is a major, major investment for them. So 
I would probably say this would be probably close to all of their investments. <laughs> yeah. You know, and again, I don't really know. Yeah. It's not like our, our place to really ask, hey, how much more yeah. money do you have? Right. But yeah, I mean, they were looking for a condo to look into, but they also went on a one year trip around the world. Um, came back within three weeks, did some research and said, hey, we live in Cochrane. You guys are in Cochrane. We'll go with you. So and then that happened, like I said, three weeks after they got back from their around the world trip kind of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I, I don't I don't think, you know, quite honestly, I, I don't think these people in general, even the other couple that purchased that one, um, have an excessive amount of money. I mean, this isn't about that. It's it's more of about I just don't want to spend. I can afford, you know, fifteen hundred dollar mortgage, two thousand dollar mortgage. I just don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, and ultimately you know, personally, I wouldn't, I don't want to do what I'm doing right now, which is paying, you know, a $2,800 mortgage myself. Right. Yeah. But it helps us, you know, get to a point where we can build this and hopefully down the road, I can sell that and buy a property and turn it into, you know, a village in some way. Mm-hmm. So you got to start somewhere. So just to get back on that, the, the property that we're sitting on, it's obviously yours and it's, you have a, a decent sized yard and then the, the, workhouses here behind us. So if you were to not live in this complex and you lived in another development or standalone home, whatever, and you had two acres, are there parameters on you having four or five show homes or building two of these and having two show homes sitting there? Is there... Uh, You're allowed to have a... You're allowed to have, according to what Bylaw is saying, one... RV. I don't think it matters on the overall size of your property. I think you're allowed to have outbuildings, which is something with a foundation. You're allowed to have up to, I think, 10 outbuildings, including like something as small as 10 by 10, uh, up to a 40 or 50 foot barn that you'd use for your cattle or Mm -hmm. hay or whatever. Uh, But you do need to have your main residence. So I've even considered just buying a farmland, same idea, rent out the house and then use the land and convert it into a RV tiny home Mm -hmm. park. So, but it's, uh, that would be closer to my five-year plan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, get the kids older now, uh, you know, they're not mm-hmm. too concerned and, you know, not too far away from civilization because they still have, you know, my wife and f- kids and they also need to go to school. And so I don't want to be commuting them, mm-hmm. you know, and we certainly won't be teaching them at home. So it's definitely cool though. I, I can, I can tell just from the answers and your willingness to sit down though, that this is definitely something that you're in for the long haul. You you guys feel as though you've kind of jumped the curve, you're ahead of the game, and it's it's something that you are are dialed in on the product that you're putting out. So it's something that you're going to be in for a long time and you're going to deal with these initial hookups that the city, county, government may have, but eventually it's going to work itself out. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been kind of on and off doing this for almost five years myself. So it's kind of like, even though we did our first one way back when doing, you know, a conversion, uh, but it was still in this idea, Mm -hmm. idea of not following into, I need a commercial retail front. I'm going to go mobile, you know, and this lady came up with this idea, do a hair salon. She can do weddings. It's awesome. She just drives right to the wedding, does all their stuff and leaves. Right. So uh, that whole idea of, you know, just not having to put out that kind yeah. of, you know, monthly commitment makes people a lot less stressed, a lot more debt free and, you know, can live their life a little happier in my mind. I just wanted to add too about um, about renting out or, or paying a mortgage. You know, just do some simple math. If you pay twelve hundred dollars a month in rent, which I actually currently do, uh, over five years, that's seventy two thousand dollars. But you can buy one of these for seventy two thousand dollars or less, and in five years you paid off. Mm-hmm. How long is it going to take you to pay off your house? You know, 25, 35 years? And you're looking at significant amount of interest. Yeah. So if you're, and if you're renting, you don't own anything. You're just renting forever and you're paying someone else's mortgage. So, you know, it makes a lot of sense, really. Uh, where do I sign? <laughs> <laughs> With okay, this- we're going to sit down and we're going to go over some of your options. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Well, that's uh, I mean, that's basically all I have. I, I think th- I think that this is, I think it's phenomenal. I think that everything here is um, is is top of the line. I, I think that your your background and your expertise is obviously what shines through. Um, but like I said earlier, I, th- I think the biggest aspect is the fact that you guys want to keep this movement going, and so it's less about making a ton of money and and kind of nickel and diming the the 
the new homeowner. It's more about customizing it to exactly what they want and fitting a really good, really good void in their life with something that you guys are, are very well versed with. Personally, I don't even care if I make a lot of money doing this. I mean, as long as I make a decent living, I'm happy. I mean, I'm, I'm doing what I like doing anyway, so I don't even really consider it like a job. You know, I, it was if I wasn't doing this, I'd be, it'd be just a hobby. But uh, I'm glad I'm doing this, and yeah, I don't care if I make a lot of money. It's just helping people out, and when you see the look on their face when they when they see the house, and you know they know that they're going to be not in debt for the next fifty years or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's no, ah, it's a good feeling, you know. Yeah, I'd probably say for myself, like right now, uh, I just uh, left my third job. I had three jobs, including this as one, but just to make my bills and payments. So I mean, I'm getting up at three a.m. in the morning. Uh, and working till probably, you know, sometimes 10, 11. Last week I left at 12 o'clock here. So, and then I'm up at three. So <laughs> glad to be done with the third job. Just kind of focused back on to doing, you know, more of the tiny home and just the general construction stuff. But uh, yeah, if I didn't have the heavy overhead, I would definitely be just doing this and I wouldn't care about the money. So, yeah. Nice. Well, I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. And, um, we uh we're gonna go warm up a little bit. Uh you we got one person sitting here in a long sleeve shirt, one person sitting in a short sleeve shirt, and I have three layers on. So <laughs> it's all good, man. <laughs> I appreciate it, guys. Yeah, welcome to Canada. <laughs>